Okay, today we're going to be learning Megillah Daf Chet. Today's Daf is sponsored by Yehudi Cohen in loving memory of Yitzhak Eitan Ben Yehudit Shulamit. Um, okay, a bit of an intro about today's Daf. Um, before we get to that, actually, I'll just remind everyone that our campaign for Circle of Friends has started for 2022. A lot of people have already joined, so thank you to all those who've already joined. If you haven't yet, please, you can take care of that on our website, or you can give a donation of any kind. Um, the idea of the Circle of Friends is to basically help support all of Hadron's activities, um, whether it be the daily Dafyomi Shear, also the extra Shearim that we have. Um, as I mentioned previously, I'll mention again, starting in January and February, we're going to have two different series, one geared toward beginners. It'll, be, it'll take place on Sundays. Um, one really geared toward beginners, getting the background and the basics of uh, Gemara for, with Rabbi Leah Sarna. That'll be three Sundays in January and, th- and three, uh, four classes in February and I believe the beginning of March. We will have, um, I will be teaching a class, the continuation of the skills class in Psachim. Again, you didn't have to take that one to do this one. If you didn't take that one, you could still do it online. And just to help build basic Gemara skills, learning how to do things on, on your own. Okay, the next thing is I want to be, give a bit of an intro to today's stuff. Okay, we're going to learn a lot of things in today's stuff that are probably, to some of you, very new concepts like a Zav, a Metzora, a Leper, and all different laws. I just want to prepare you by saying this is going to be a little bit complicated, but what I want to say is that... Um, don't worry if you don't understand everything. And you might say there's a new concept. I don't really understand it. These concepts are going to come up many, many times. It's one of the great things about Tafiomi is that you learn them and you get to them. You know, I'll, I'll just give you a personal example. When I got to this yesterday, I said, when I was preparing, I said, oh, yeah, I know all this already. Because in the beginning, you know, when you first get to it, it's until you get it in your head. What is a, a Zav like this and a Zav like that? And what are the differences? And it's really hard. And it was even for me also learning it. It was complicated. But after you do it so many times, it becomes ingrained and you just already get the differences. So if you're at the more beginning stages, don't worry. If you've seen this many times, you still don't understand it, don't worry. There's every time you see it over and over again, it'll just become more and more clear to you. So if you leave today's year thinking, these are new concepts, I don't really fully understand them. Don't worry. It's okay. Okay. Not everyone's going to understand them fully and you'll see them over and over again. Okay. Um, today's staff is sponsored, did I say, I thought I said it, but I don't know, maybe I didn't. Today's staff is sponsored by Yehudi Kohen, in loving memory of Yitzhak Eitan ben Yehudi Shulamit. Okay, we're now going to get started. Eim ben hamudar hana'a mechavero, lemudar mimenu ma'achal, ere drisat ha-rega v'kelim she'en osem behem ochal nefesh. We're going to start the daf easy, we're going to end the daf easy, but we're going to have complicated things in the middle. Okay, right now, and you may say, easy, what is easy? Well, this is also a concept we're not as used to, but... One could theoretically, first of all, I'm just reminding you, we're in the middle of all these Mishnayot that basically say there's no difference between this and that other than this. And because of that, we're going to get into many different topics that seem that don't really connect to each other, but they connect through this language that the Mishnah was formulated in a particular way to say there's no difference between this and that other than this. The Gemara in each case is going to immediately say, oh, well, if this is the only difference, then this must be the same about them. And then the Gemara is going to say, how do we know that this is a difference? Okay, in most of the cases, not in the first one, because the first one's pretty easy, but some of the other ones, they're going to say, where do we derive this from the verses in the Torah? So what is a mudal hana ame chavero? That means if I vow, I am not going to benefit from you at all. Okay, maybe I get angry at you and I say, I refuse to get any benefit from you. Alternatively, I could say, I don't want to get any food-related benefit from you. Maybe I think your cooking is awful. And I make a vow, I don't want to have anything to do with your food ever again. Now, what's the difference? Because theoretically, most benefit that I will get from you, according to this mission, the way the mission reads it is, is really food-related benefit. So what's the main differences? Well, there's two differences. Drisata regal, that means I can't pass through your property. If I say food, has nothing to do with your property. But if I say I won't benefit from you at all, it includes passing through your property. Now, some of the commentaries say it's only if it actually helps me. Like if I have two ways to go and they're exactly the same and I decide to go through your property rather than the other way for no real reason, not because it's any shorter or quicker or shadier or something like that, then maybe that's not called benefit. But if it's shadier that way, right? How many times do we choose a particular street because it's shady, right? Or we choose a particular street because it's sunny. You know, maybe on a day in the winter, you want the sunnier side. Or you choose it because it's a quicker way to get there. Any of those reasons, if I say I'm not going to get benefit, food-related benefits, so of course I can walk through your property. But if I say I'm not going to get 
any benefit, then I can't walk through your property. And the second thing is kelim she'eno simbehem ochal nefesh. If I borrow vessels from you that that you don't that aren't used for food at all. Now, some people say it doesn't mean it's not used for food. Some people say it means it's not used to prepare food, even if you would maybe eat food on it. it. Could be it's prepared food, or even that you don't put food in it, right? So if I want to borrow a bowl, and the bowl is a bowl that you never use for food, it's a bowl that you use for I don't know what, but you know, let's say to soak your feet in or something like that. So then I can borrow that if I say food, but if I say I'm not going to benefit from you at all, I can't borrow that. To which the Gemara says something very obvious, which is, But if I want to borrow a pot from you, even though it's not food, it's connected to food, and therefore, either which way, I can't borrow it from you. To the Rishat HaRegel, the Gemara says, But wait, why can't I walk through your property? That is something in general that people don't really care about. Okay, it depends where some people do care about this, but I guess the general rule, doesn't really bother people so much that you walk through. So it has, what is benefit to me? Benefit to me has to be something that you generally don't allow people to do. Otherwise, if you right, if you allow people to go through all the time, then it's not something you really care about, and then I'm not really benefiting from you. So to which the Gemara says, Amarava, Rava explains, Ha mani Rabbi Eliezer. Our Mishnah must be, according to Rabbi Eliezer, who holds, Damal, Vitur Asur B'mudar Hana'ah. Even if it's something that I really don't care about, okay, let's say you were the one who took the nadir not to benefit from me. If it's something that I could care less about and you use it, that's still considered benefit. In other words, it doesn't have to be that I am um, careful and I don't allow things to other people for it to be considered that you've benefited from it. If it's something I let anybody use and I, I really could care less, anyone can walk through my property, it doesn't bother me. That's still considered benefit to you, even though I don't care about it. And that is a, is a debatable point. So basically, the people who disagree with Rabbi Eliezer wouldn't put Drisat HaRegel in this Mishnah. They would say Drisat HaRegel is allowed even to someone who you vowed you're not going to get any benefit from. Because Drisat HaRegel is not a measurable type of pleasure because the owner doesn't really care about it. Okay, new Mishnah. Ein bein nedarim lenedavot. This is also something that's going to appear many, many, many more times in the Gemara, which is the difference between two different types of vows. One is called the neder, one is called the nedava. Both of them, I say, I'm going to bring a sacrifice to the temple, but the language I use is different. And because the language I use is different, therefore, one of them, if something happens to the animal that I chose and it gets lost or it dies or something like that, I will have to replace it. That's a neder. A nedava, I don't have to replace it. That means, I'm not responsible for it. If I designate this animal to go as a sacrifice, as a nedava sacrifice, and something happens to the animal, I'm, I'm finished. My obligation is done. I obviously didn't fulfill my obligation, but I don't anymore have to fulfill it, and you'll see why in another minute. So the first thing the Gemara does is, again, infers in what way are they similar. Something about Neder and Nedava, we actually learned this in a previous Masechet, which is all about when I bring a sacrifice to the temple, when I promise I'm going to bring it, when do I have to bring it? I have a certain time frame. It says, right? It says, Lota Acher Lishalmo, don't delay in bringing it to the temple. What does that mean? There were many different interpretations. One holiday, three holidays, three holidays starting with a particular one. We had all different explanations. I believe there were five different explanations. But the point is, it doesn't matter what explanation we go by, the point is that both Nedar and Nedava fall into this category that if you don't pay up on time, whatever on time means, you are, right, you've oh, you've done a prohibition of the Torah, okay? You've uh, transgressed a prohibition of not paying your your sacrifice on time. Now we're going to bring up a Mishnah. Tznan Hatam. It says there in a Mishnah, Ezehu Nedar. We're now going to have what is a Nedar, what is a Nedava, and here we're going to get into the details. Haomer, if you say, Hare alai ola, I am accepting upon myself to bring a burnt offering. It could be any offering, but let's just, here's just an example of an ola. I accept alai on myself. Now you can see why I'm responsible if something happens to the animal. First I say, I'm accepting upon myself a sacrifice. Then I designate an animal. So, ma be nida, uh, sorry, so if, okay, we'll get into it inside, but basically the idea is since I said a lie, it's on me. That means it's on me. It has nothing to do with if something happened to the animal, I'm still responsible. Ezohi nidava, 
Haomer hare zo ola. A nidava is when I see an animal. I'm walking on the street, I see an animal, or I go into my, my, my barn and, you know, where I have all my animals, and I see, I go into the pen where the sheep are, and I point to a sheep and I say, this one is going to a korban ola. Now you can see the difference, because I promised this one. And if something happens to this one and it's no longer there, I'm not responsible, because I designated that one. I didn't designate, I didn't say, I am bringing a sacrifice on myself. I said, this animal will be a sacrifice. So ma be nidarim le didavot, the Mishnah there says, nidarim meto nignevu o avdu chayab achal yutan. When it comes to a neder, if the animal died or it was stolen or it got lost, I'm responsible because I said I'm going to bring something, so I still have to bring something. Nidavot. But when it comes to a nidava offering, meto nignevu o avdu, eno chayab achal yutan. Then I'm not responsible because I designated that animal. That animal's no longer here. I don't have to do anything. Minahane Mile, where do we get this from? Ditanu Abanam, we're going to bring a Braita. The Darshan's the Pasuk in the beginning of Sefer Bayikra, Pasuk 4, okay, Dalid in chapter 1. Vin Nirza lo lechaper alav. It says you put, you do smicha on the animal, this is the Korban Ola, and Nirza lo, you get it, 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 it is appeasing, okay, what you brought, lechaper alav, to give atonement to you. Now notice it says alav to you. So here comes the Drasha, Rabbi Shimon Omer. What is upon you, meaning you said, I will bring it, then you're responsible. But not if it's not on you, but on the animal. So the Gemara says, my master, where exactly do you get this from the verse? Because it says, alav in the pasuk. So since you said, alai, ami, keman detayin akatve dami. It's as if you put it on your shoulders. Right? We always say, right, a burden on your shoulders. It means it's your responsibility. New Mishnah. Here starts the complicated part of the daf. Okay, before we start with the zav, I want to explain what a zav is. Okay, I feel like that would be a, a way to sort of get into and somewhat understand what a zav is. So a zava is a, a woman. Okay, let's start with a nida. Okay, to get to zava, we have to do nida. So a woman who's menstruating has, according to Torah law, and this is not what we do nowadays, because nowadays we treat all women as maybe nidas, maybe zavas, and because of that, we have all these stringencies. But according to Torah law, a nida is a nida in, for seven days. She's a, men, a menstruating woman, is tmea, impure, for seven days, including the days that she bleeds. On the seventh day, after the seventh day is over, on the eighth day at night, meaning the, the end of the seventh day, at night she goes to the mikvah and she's pure. Okay? Even, right, she doesn't need seven clean days. Then we have a zava. A zava is someone who sees blood either beyond the nida days, like on day number eight or nine or ten, or even beyond that, before it's her next cycle. Okay, there's a whole debate about how to calculate when is her next cycle going to be. But let's just say there's, generally we say there's 11 days, there's 11 days between Nida and Nida, so the next 11 days are potential Zava days after her period, after those seven days of menstruating. Now, if she sees blood then, there's a difference if she sees blood one day, two days, or three days. If she sees one or two, she just waits, she's right, she's impure that day, she sees blood, she goes to the mikvah the next morning, and she's what's called, and we're going to see this in the Gemara later, today, Shomeret Yom Keneged Yom. That means for every day she sees, she has to watch the next day to see, is she going to see blood again? So she goes to the mikvah in the morning, but all the people who go to the mikvah in the morning, right, as opposed to Anita, who goes at night, and she becomes pure immediately. All the other tefillot, other than Anita and a woman who gave birth, go to the mikvah in the morning, and then they wait for the sun to set until they become fully pure. That whole day after she goes to the mikvah, she waits and checks. Is she, does she have any more bleeding? If she does, so if it's day number one and then it's day number two, she sees blood, she waits one more day. She's still considered Shomer Yom Keneged Yom. Once she sees three, and then if no blood that day, she's fine that night. Okay, the sun sets, she's good. But if she sees three days, she's called a Zavagdola. She needs seven clean days. And she brings a sacrifice, okay? That's the sacrifice of a zava. She brings pairs of birds. This sacrifice of zava, okay? That's zava gedola. A man, there's something different. Now, for a woman, it's blood. For a man, there's something called gonorrhea. It's a disease, okay? This is the zav for the man is a disease. And it's, he, it's, we're going to have also one, two, and three, okay? But it's different than the one, two, and three of a woman. The one, two, so again, number one, it's different because it's a clear discharge. It's not bloody. Okay, it comes from a disease. It's not from irregular bleeding. And it's, right, so it's similar in name only, really, okay, but it's very different. 
And then it's it it has the numbers one, two, and three, but they're not days. They're viewings of some discharge, okay? So if he sees a discharge come out one time, that's Azav with one Re'iyah. We're not going to talk about him at all. That's a, a different, it's very minor, okay? It doesn't have most of the laws that we're going to talk about today. But if already he sees two, <clears throat> and obviously there's a whole discussion about within how many days and all that. I'm not going to get into that right now. Let's just talk about how many times he sees a discharge. The second time. That's a Zav Baal Shtei Re'iyot, we're going to see. Okay, that means he saw twice. And then there's three Re'iyot. So the mission is discussing the two and the three and the differences between them and the similarities. And then what we're going to do, this is the, the significant part of today's stuff, is all these different drashot on the psukim, how we learn this, and counter suggestions. Why do we say this and not that? And why do we say this and not that? And why don't we say that, you know, and all that. Okay, so we're going to basically say these are the differences. These are the similarities. Where do we get all that from the psukim? And why don't we darsh in these psukim in a different manner? So, So now we're going to get into the details. So the Zavu sees two re'iyot is tamay. He's impure. Okay, now we're going to see in a minute. There's tumat mishkav and moshav. These are things that are classic for the Zav, Zava, Yoledet, Nida, Mitzora. That things they sit on, things they lie on things they step on, they all have tuma, even if I don't touch them. Okay, so if something's underneath me, we talked about this before, the princess and the pea, right? It's like if I have, I'm sitting on a mattress and underneath are other mattresses and then there's, right? Even the bottom one is going to be tame, okay? Because that's called mishkav or moshav, anything I sit on. So that's true already for two. You have this tuma on you, but you only bring a korban, just like the woman only brings a korban when she's seven days, right? When she has a zavagdola, she's got the three days. Also, a man only brings a korban when he has three re'iyot, okay? By the way, another similarity about them we're going to see in one minute is that they count seven clean days, okay? Just like the woman has to count seven clean days if she's a zavagdola, right? A zavaktana already is the next day can be pure, right? She goes to the mikvah and she waits till the nighttime and she's fine. But a zavagdola has to wait seven clean days. That's where nowadays we get the seven clean days from. A zav also has to, but we're going to see a zav has to wait the seven clean days. Notice it's not in our Mishnah. So that means even if he saw only two times, he has to wait the seven days. Okay, again, all this we're going to try to find in the verses. So how, So the only difference between them is the korban. Once you see three, you're not only tamay seven days, right? You have to wait the seven clean days, but also you bring a sacrifice. So, so again, comes in our Gemara and says, well, if their only difference is this, then they must be similar about everything else. What's the similarity? In Mishkav and Moshav, meaning all the level of Tumah that they have, that they get things, things can become impure just by sitting or lying on them and counting the seven clean days, they must be the same. So where do we get all this from? So first we're going to have a Brayta. Rabbi Simai Omer. Rabbi Simai says the following. Mana katuv shtayim ukraotame. Shalosh ukraotame. We can't really understand this till we look at the verses. I brought the verses on the sheet. If you have the sheet, if someone could put it up in the chat in case anyone came late, you could put it up again. That would be great. Um, okay, here come the verses. If you're, if you're listening, so you can find it if you're on the podcast. The de- it's in the details of the podcast. And if you're on our website, you can find the, the source sheet on the website. So in Vayikra chapter 15, that's where we are right now. It says in Pasuk Bet, Dabru el b'nei Israel, speak to the Jewish people, v'amartem alehem, and tell them, right, because God spoke to Moshe and Aaron, I skipped that Pasuk, and tell them, Ish ish ki yet zav mivsaho, zavo tamehu. How many times does the word, the root zav appear in that Pasuk? Twice. It's actually very easy to remember. In Pasuk 2, okay, Bet, there's two mentions of the word zav, and then it says tameh. That's where Rabbi Simai says, Right, it said Zav two times, and then it said the word Tamehu. Okay, then that's what we're going to learn two times your Tameh already. Pasuk Gimel, which is funny because it's the third Pasuk, it's going to have the root Zav three times, and then it's going to have the root Tameh at the end. So, Tumato, Bizovo, that's number one, Garb Saro, Et Zovo, that's number two. Orichtim b'saromi zavo, number three, tum atohi. So three mentions of the word zav. So Rabbi Simai points that out by saying, right, the Torah counted two times zav and then called it tamei, and then three times zav and called it tamei. 
Haketzav. Why did the Torah do this? Shtayim letumah v'shalosh the korban. He says very simply, it's to teach you, even though they're both the same, two times av tumah, three times av tumah, it must be the tumah of this is different from the tumah of that. How could it be different? It must be that the three brings a sacrifice. Okay, and it's very logical to say that once you see three times, you need something additional. So to say tumah, then sacrifice, that makes a lot of sense. However, the Gemara is going to throw up all sorts of suggestions that maybe you could understand it differently. Okay, and that's the chart on the page that I charted out. These two other suggestions, if you're going to have a difference between two and three, maybe the difference is could be flipped, could be different. Why don't we suggest this? And that's what the Gemara is going to do right now. Ve'ema, why don't you say, Shtayim letuma velo le korban. Two is tuma and not korban. Shalosh le korban velo le tuma. And the two and three are different. If you see two times, you're impure. No cor- no sacrifice. If you see three times, you bring a sacrifice, but you're not impure. You don't have impurity to you. To which the Gemara answers the very obvious answer, which is, Amart ad shalosh ra'ash shalosh ra'ash daim. How could you possibly say that? Once... In order to get to seeing three times, you have to pass first two times. You can't get to three without seeing two. Once you see two, you're already impure. So you can't say once you see the third, the tumma just leaves you. The tumma already got on to you after two. Two is included in three. So there's no way to suggest that. So they reject that answer, that suggestion. Next suggestion. Ve'ema. Shtayim le korban velo le tumma. Let's, okay, well, if you can't say you're tame and then, right, and you can't say, Two is Tameh and three is Korban without impurity. You could, though, flip it and say two brings a Korban but isn't impure yet. Only when you get to three does the impurity get upon you. So, Imer, Shtayim le Korban velo le Shalosh af le right? We already said three has to add on to two. So you can't get rid of the Korban. The Korban will be two or three, but you're not going to actually be impure until you get to the third time. So the Gemara says, Lo This doesn't seem logical because of the following. Ditanya, it says in another bright, and I just want to, before we move on, I want to have the structure clear. We started off with this bright of Rabbi Simai that proved, right, it said two times is for Tuma, three times is for Korban, and that we got from the verse because it says Zav three times, two times, and then three times in both places. Tameh, it must be adding something additional, it must be adding Korban. Now, by rejecting this other possibility, by bringing a brighter to say maybe the possibility is that two is korban and three is tuma, we're going to bring another brighter, which in essence, by disproving suggestion three, or right, there were kind of two suggestions, but it's the third because the first is Rabbi Simai. By rejecting this, it's basically proving Rabbi Simai. So as soon as we finish this brighter, I just want to show you where the structure is going. We're basically going to question why do you need Rabbi Simai's Brita and this Brita? Because in essence, they're both saying the same thing. Okay, that's going to be the next section. But let's read the Brita and then we'll see that. Los al it doesn't make sense to say that two would be Korban and three would be impurity. Because Ditanya v'chipel alav ha-kohen l'fne Hashem mizovo. We're now skipping to, to the... Um, to Pasuk Tetvav in that same chapter. I also brought it on the sheet next to Aleph Bet Gimel. The next Pasuk I brought there is Tetvav. So in, in verse 15 it says, V'asa otama kohen echad chata echad ola. He brings two sacrifices, the Zav. One is a chata, one is an ola. V'chiper alav a kohen lefne Hashem mi zovo. The kohen atones for him before God from his Zav, from the fact that he has this discharge. Now, me usually in the world of drashot, and we're going to a little bit not have this say later, but right now, assume this is the case, and this usually happens. When I say from something, I usually mean not the entire thing. Not, you know, in this case, it'll be not every case of Zav. It's saying from the Zav, from only some cases of Zav and not all cases of Zav. That's what this drasha is going to say. So when it says the Kohen atones for him, from his Zav, from means only some Zav, again, this isn't the simple reading, but from is coming to be an exclusionary term. Not every case of Zav is going to need this atonement of the sacrifice. That's why you can't say two for sacrifice and three for Tuma, for impurity, because not from Mizovo we learn, not all Zavim become need a sacrifice. Okay, like I said, we're not talking about the one Re'iyah because that's already something much more minor. Okay, but even within the more major, one of them does, one of them doesn't. Therefore, it must be the three is the one that needs it. So now they say, right, so again, 
How, if we're going to say some need, some don't, which way is it going to go? How, uh, we already know it's going to have to be then some is three and not two, because if it was two and not three, we'll have the same problem we said before, which is two is included in three, and that's exactly what the Gemara is going to say now. Ha so how does this work that some need a sacrifice and some don't? Ra'a shalosh mevi. If you see three times, then you have to bring a sacrifice. Shtayim, but two eno mevi. To which the Brightus suggests, maybe it's the reverse. Oh, eno ela ra'a shtayim mevi. If you see two, you have to bring a sacrifice, but ra'a shalosh eno mevi. But if you see three, you don't. Again, the Gemara is going to reject, the Bright is going to reject it for the same reason as we saw before. Anyone who sees three already saw two. So he's already obligated in a korban. It's not like you could say, now that I saw three, oh, I don't have to bring the sacrifice anymore. I already saw two. Obviously, I have to bring a sacrifice. So therefore, it must be the reverse. Someone who sees three brings a sacrifice. Someone who sees two doesn't bring a sacrifice. So what's the difference, right? So that's the big difference between them. But both of them obviously have impurity. And again, that just proves Rabbi Simai's drasha. We tried to bring two counter drasha to his explanation of the fact that verse two has two mentions of Zav and verse three has three mentions and there must be some difference between them. What difference? Well, we've now proven what difference it is. So now they want to know. It's to Rabbi Simai, the it's drift Mizavo, as I told you before. In the end, they both teach the same thing, that two for Toma, three for Zav. One learned it from the Pasuk of Zav, Zav, Tame, Zav, 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 Tame. And the other one learned it from Mizovo. Not all Zavim are the same. So why do you need both Drashot? You could have just learned it from one. Well, not actually. This is our classic Itzrit. You need them because if you only have one, you would have thought blah, blah, blah. And if you only had the other, you would have thought blah, blah, blah. So that's what we're going to explain right now. Itzrit, Rabbi Simai, the Itzrit, Mizovo. Di'ime, Rabbi Simai, Havamina, Kikushyan. Well, once we have Rabbi Simai, the two is one way and three is a different way, but we have no idea which one and we suggested all these other suggestions. So Rabbi Simai's drasha is clearly not clear enough because if it were clear enough, we wouldn't have any questions on it. So therefore, you need the drasha of Mizovo to prove what is the difference, right? The fact that there's a difference, that's already proven from Pasuk Bet and Pasuk Gimel, the two mentions and the three mentions. But what the difference is, is not clear until we bring the drasha of um, of the chiper alav kohen mizovo. So then the Gemara obviously says, well, imi so why don't you just bring that? That already distinguishes between different types of zavim. One brings a korban, one doesn't. You should be able to have that. You don't need pas gimel and bet and gimel, two, three, etc. So imi zovo, lo yadana kama But the, what's the weakness of the mizovo argument? Well, the mizovo or the mizovo drasha, it distinguishes between different types of zavim. But it doesn't distinguish between how many. Maybe you think four times or five times or one time. or We have no idea what the difference is. Once you have verses two and three in the drasha of Rabbi Simai, you know if you have the combination of the two. The drasha of Mizovo proves to you one brings a sacrifice, one doesn't. The drasha of two and three sets up for you how many viewings, you know, how many sightings of a discharge is is going to be this distinction. It's going to be between two and three and not between one and two or three and four or something like that. So therefore, kamash malan di rabbi simai. That's why you need rabbi simai. Okay. We could have ended here, but the Gemara now goes off on a tangent. Classic. So we already just darshaned right now, mizovo. Mizovo, we said, comes to say, not all zavim, right? Have to bring a korban. So the Gemara now says, Hashta da amart mizovo le drasha. Now that you said that the word mizovo comes for a drasha, well, in another pasuk in that section, we're now jumping backwards from Tefav to Yud Gimel to the verse thirteen, to say where it also says mizovo, and the question is going to be, what did we darshan from that mention of mizovo? V'chi yital hazav mizovo my darshit be. Okay, the verse here says. When the Zav becomes pure from his Zav, meaning when he stops having a discharge, he then counts his seven days once he's no longer having discharges. Then he goes through a purification process. So we're now going to darshan three things from this Pasuk. Okay, one of them. So let's start. means That means he has to wait until he has no longer any discharges. This uh, mizavo comes to teach you mizavo below mizavo venigo. It means you have to be pure from your zav, but you don't have to be impure from other things. That means if, let's say, a man is a zav and he starts, right, he finishes having his discharges, 
and he wants to start counting his clean days. But what if he has some other impurity upon him? Like for instance, he has leprosy. Is he allowed to count seven clean days for Zav if he is Tame for some other reason? And the answer is yes. Mizovo comes to say he can start counting as long as his Zav is dealt with, even if he's got some other issue. That's what it means. Mizovo, below Mizovo vinigo. Nega is a nega tzarat, a leprous mark. He doesn't have to be impure from leprosy and Zav. He just has to be, he has to have stopped the discharges. Mizovo v'safar, another drush on this word mizovo, the fact that it's juxtaposed to the word, mizovo v'safar lo, and then he starts to count his seven clean days, comes to teach you, limed al zav ba'al shte re'iot, shita'un sfirat shiv'a. This is to teach you, and the minute they're going to tell you how they learned this and why they wouldn't learn otherwise, this is to teach you that a zav who sees twice needs to count seven days. Now, we already knew this was the case. Because we said, remember, there's no difference between them other than the Korban. And then the Gemara said, well, that means that for counting seven clean days, they have to count seven clean days. The question is, where do they get that from? They get it from here. Because it says, Mizovovis Safal, which seems to say anyone who's a Zav then would count, even if it's only two Re'iyot. Now, obviously, okay, maybe you didn't catch this yet, but if you did, you'll see where the Gemara is going, which is, the first time we had Mizovo, it was limiting. It was saying only three, not two. This Mizovo is including even two. So we're going to have to deal with that in a little bit. Okay, that's going to be a question that Rav Papa is going to ask Abaye. I don't get it. Why is Mizovo limiting? And the other case, Mizovo is expanding. But just be clear, they're expanding right now. We'll have to deal with that in a bit. So now they say, why do you even need a drasha to tell you that someone who sees two times would have to wait seven clean days? But hello, Dinu, it's obvious. Why is it? It's a logical, it would be very logical. Why? Moshav. Once you already know that it has Tuma Mishkav and Moshav and all the severe Tuma of Azav, well then, Lo Yehitaun Sviracheva, shouldn't it go hand in hand? The let, right, the impurity of sitting on things, lying on things, shouldn't that go hand in hand with the counting of the seven clean days? To which the Gemara says, no, it shouldn't. Why? Where are we going to prove it from? This is why I started with the Zava, with the Zava. Because Shomerit Yom Keneged Yom Tochiach. I told you, that's the language we use for a Zava who saw one or two days and it's just called a Zava Ktana, doesn't need to wait seven clean days. However, her level of Tuma is Mishkav and Moshe. She has all, right, her, she can be Mitame everything by sitting on it, lying on it, etc. So here you see, Shemitama Mishkav and Moshe, Ve'ena Tuna Svirat Shiva. Those things don't go hand in hand because we see with the Zava Ktana, they don't go hand in hand. So that's why you need a drasha to prove it. And Mizavo Vistafar comes to prove even to Riyot, you need to wait the seven clean days. Apata alti tamal and don't, this is just a continuation of this rejection of this uh, Zava, uh, you know, using the Zava to reject that it would have been obvious without. Apata alti tamal don't be surprised by this whole thing that Mishkav and Moshev don't go hand in hand with seven clean days. In other words, you might think that maybe he doesn't need seven. Talmud Lomar, Mizavov Safal. That's why you need the drasha. This is just the continuation. It's just explaining what we just know is obvious, which is that's why you need the drasha to tell you. How do you get it from Mizavo? Just having a little bit of Zav, meaning not a full Zav, not three, but two, just having a little bit of that already requires Sfira, the counting. From here we learn, this was just to get back to where we started in this section, that a Zav who sees two times would end up having to need seven clean days. So Amrle Rapapa Labaya, I promised you Rapapa would get back to this question. Why in this case, the second case, the last one we just said, why Mizavov Safar is including the Zav who sees two, two times? Umaish Nahai Mizavo, what about the first time we saw Mizavo? Timimai Bezav Bal Shteriyo, which limited it, right? And said it, the Korban, the sacrifice, right? The Kohen did it Mizavo, which would say that only, right? Only the three times brings a Korban. So why is one including and one excluding? So the Gemara says, Amr Leh, Abaye answers him, Isal Kadata Chaylemi Ute Huda'ata. If, let's go back now. Really, it's usually Lema'et. Let's just assume. And that's true across the board. 
may something usually comes to ex exclude things. However, let's look back at this Pasuk Yugimel. It's on the very bottom of the source sheet that I brought today, study guide. V'chi yital hazav mizavo, v'safalo shivat yamim. Okay, when it becomes impure, the zav. Now, what is a zav becoming impure from, if not from his zovo, right? So you could have just ignored the word mizovo. If you wanted to exclude, what would you have done? You would have said, if it's limiting, it just should have ignored the word mizovo. It just would have said, and if yitar has zav. Now, generally, what's a zav? A zav is someone like a zava, and this is really where they're going to get it from, that saw three times. So therefore, we'd already know that it was only three comes, therefore, the extra word to say it's not what we thought, that it's three, it's also two. That's basically the theory here. Okay? The chi tema. Now, you might say, atimidina, that maybe it's just obvious that zav would be two re'iyot also. No, shomeret yom keneged yom tochiach. We're going to learn it from the zava. That since the zava only waits, only counts seven clean days when she's got three days of seeing, likewise, a man would only be if he sees three times, okay? So that's the first reason why they think if it just said Zav, the obvious would be who counts seven clean days only if he saw three times because with the Zav, it's very clear and therefore maybe here also it would be three. The Chitema, now you might say though, wait a minute though, we need the word Mizavo for some other reason. Their whole theory is the word Mizavo is extra. You didn't need it. The fact that you don't need it means if you didn't have it, what would we think the simple reading was? Oh, who counts seven clean days? Someone who sees three times. The fact that they added an extra word must come to teach something different, must come to teach two. Comes the Gemara and says, but wait, we already darshan something else from Mizavo, remember? Mizavo velo Mizavo vinigo, right? It's when he becomes pure from, from what? Not from everything. When can he count to seven clean days? As long as he finishes his Zav discharge. So they say, Right, maybe that's why you have the word mizavo, which is pretty obvious that you have it for that. Well, still, you really didn't need it. No, when you say v'chiyatar hazav, obviously, what do you mean? That the zav is nitar from his zav discharge. What else would you think? Meaning, you could have just learned that simply from the word zav. You didn't need the word misovo, and therefore they conclude, and this is the end of this section, misovo, lamali, if you're having trouble with the zav, or at least ending it now, limed al zav ba'al shte re'iyot sheta'un svirat shiva. So again, back coming full circle, this all proves that the word misovo, even though normally it's a limiting word, in this case, since the simple reading of the verse would already have limited it, the obvious, what I would have thought the logical would have been three, misovo must add something additional, and that's why it adds two. Okay. Now, next case. Now we're moving on to a lep uh, leper. And this is going to be a little easier to understand because we're going to this is going to be very similar to laws of quarantine and corona. Okay? It's going to be a very easy way to understand the mitzora. There's two types of mitzoras. Okay? It's really all one and the same. Let's say you think you have a leprous mark. What do you do? You go to a kohen. The kohen declares you a mitzora, but he doesn't really. We're going to see. What happens? First, he says, Go quarantine for seven days. Okay, this is like a case where I was exposed to someone who had corona. I'm told to quarantine for seven days. I don't have any necessarily clear signs of corona, right? I have something that may be, right? In, in the case of Mitzora, I have some mark, which might be leprous, might not. In our case of corona, it's just I was exposed to someone, let's say. So I go and I'm, that's called a, a Mitzora Muzgal. I'm closed, I'm quarantined. After seven days, the coin looks and sees what, how did the Sarah develop? Okay, right? it's, it's like when you go to a doctor, right? It, you know, the first day they see you, okay, it's not so bad, but then they see it, it's continued, you've had fever for seven days, oh, now it must be serious. So after seven days, the coin checks you. If he says, this is not Sarat, then you're done, you're finished. That's all Mitzora Muzgar, and you have your own purification process of that, which is different from the purification process of a real Mitzora. Then if he says, right, like you're going to quarantine, you're done, okay, you have took a corona test, you're fine. If you took a corona test and you're positive, right? If the coin comes back and says, this is sara'at, then you have to quarantine for another seven days, right? Very logical, like corona. Okay, that's not enough. You're still sick. You have to quarantine for another seven days. And at the end of that process, you do this whole purification process, which we'll see other times. You bring sacrifice, you bring birds, you do, um, you do, um, and you shave your all the hair on your body. Okay, that's tiglachat and sipori, we're going to see. 
So the Gemara, the Mishnah says, Ein be mitzora muzgar le mitzora muchlat. Those are the two types. The one who was quarantined and the one who was muchlat. Muchlat means it was determined that you were a leper. Ela pria uflima. Okay, another thing that I didn't mention is it says in the verse that if you have tzara'at, if you're a leper, you have to tear your clothes and grow your hair long. Okay, pria is to grow your hair long, frima is to tear your clothes. So that's one difference, that's the one difference between them. Okay, otherwise they're both quarantined, okay? Quarantine is the same. It's, just, it's true one is longer, but that's a different story. But in any case, the main thing is that you don't tear your clothes and grow your hair long if you're um, a mitzora muzga. What about the purification process? The main difference is tiglach Okay, that's the two differences. You have to shave your body and um, shave your uh, uh, shave your hair on your body and bring the birds. Otherwise, purification process is the same as well. So now the Gemara says, So again, what's the what's the what's the similarity? Linyan shiloch zevzeshavim. In terms of quarantine, you have to be out of the camp, or you have to go out all three camps. You have to be far away, and you're impure. You have the same level of impurity for both muzgar and muchlat. Minan emile. Where do we get this from? You see, the structure is the same for all these Mishnayot. So where do we get it from? He says, we bring a bright mispachati. The coin purifies you. This is after the first seven days. If he says you're a muzgal. Mispachati, it was just really a scab. So now, v'tahir, it should be And you will become impure. You go to a mikvah and you'll become impure. But it says v'tahir, which is you were pure. What does it mean you were pure? So the drasha is tahor mi priyal frima. It must be something before you were exempt from. That's what tahor, tahir, that, um, in the, in the past tense. Vitahir, you will be pure. Sorry, I might have said impure. I meant pure. You were pure to begin with, meaning you didn't have to tear your clothes and grow your hair long. That's his drasha. We're going to demei ikara, right? From the beginning. But now the Gemara says, no, okay. Rava says to him, Amr Rava, this is a, not a good drasha. If you want to say Tahir, always means going retroactively to something previous, saying you were really pure to begin with. Well, by Zav, it says the same thing. When it really means, and he purifies himself right now. It certainly doesn't mean he was pure before. Zav wasn't pure at all before. There is no, he was pure from something from the beginning. There, He was totally impure from the beginning. Ella, so what must it mean, vitahir, by the zvav? We're going to say, what does it mean there? And then we're going to say, it must mean the same thing by the mitzvah, and then they knock, he knocks out this drasha entirely. Tahor hashta militame kli cheres You have to know all these things, which is, another way zav can be mitame is, if I, let's say, elbow something, I knock something over, and it knocks something else over, that's heset. I Or it doesn't have to knock it over, it just has to move it. If I move something by not actually touching it, that's too much heset. So if I do that to a kli cheres, okay, if I'm a zav, I can make that to me, okay, even though I'm not a zav, but whatever. So now, what does that mean? So what does this have to do with v'tahir? Well, let's say I go to the mikvah in the morning. We already discussed. The zav goes to the mikvah in the morning, and then he waits for the sun to set that night. Now, in between that time, what if, okay, let's say he starts off the day, goes to the mikvah, and then he moves some utensil. Now, he doesn't, he's not really tamay at that point. But, af agav dahadr chazeh, what if later in that day, he saw another discharge, which means that his mikvah is really wiped out. It's as if he didn't go to the mikvah. Well, guess what? It's not totally as if he didn't go to the mikvah. Vitahir means as soon as you go to the mikvah, anything you touch at that point, even hesate, right, is going to be okay. until Even if you later that day see, and you're, it's as if your mikvah was, was not relevant because you're back to Tumat Zav, Still, it counts for the fact that you don't retroactively, the things that were in between that time that you went to the mikvah and you saw some new Zav discharge will be pure. Hachanami, same thing we're going to say by the Mitzorah. If you bring items into my house and I'm a leper, anything in the house becomes Tameh. It's like a dead person, okay? That everything in the house becomes Tameh. So if I went to the mikvah in the morning and then you brought in things to the house and then all of a sudden in the afternoon before I become fully pure, I find that I have another leprous mark. So anything you brought into the house in between that time, let's say I'm not in the house anymore, when I find my leprous mark, will become will not become impure because I it was in between the time. That's the vitahir. Okay, so it doesn't mean we're 
he, he, what the drasha tried to say. So Ella Amarava, Rava brings a different proof for our halacha. Vahatsarua asher bohanega. Okay, again, look at the verses on the sheet. Hatsarua asher bohanega, we're in Vayikra Yugimel Pasuk Memhe 45. Hatsarua asher bohanega, begadav yufrumim v'rosho yeparua. It says, Vitsarua that has a nega. That means only if he really is a leper, not if he was just quarantined in concern he had a, a mark. So that's how we understand that. Mishet sarato talui begufo. Yatzaz de she'en sarato talui abegufo ela biyamim. It's not someone who was dependent on days. It was someone who was dependent on its body, right? Not a muzga. So Armale Abaye, Abaye tries to reject this, but he won't succeed. Ela me'ata. Kol yamei asher anega bo yitma. But then it says anyone, right? Any days asher anega bo, anyone who's, who had a nega bo. Okay, now this is the pasuk about leaving the machane. Now, what do we say? That applies to everybody, not just someone who is the negabo, who is sick, actually. So they say, it sounds like, Mishit sarato tuli abagufo, who did ta'un shiluach? He has to leave the camp. Vishayin sarato tuli abagufo, ain't ta'un shiluach. But then you wouldn't have to, according to what you're saying. Every time it says bo, it means it really sick and not just quarantined. Well, you wouldn't need to leave the camp. So they say, and if you want to say maybe they really don't, we already proved that you do we need to leave the camp. We learned it in the Mishnah. The only difference is, but from there you can derive being sent out of the Machane and the Timuye Bibia and all the impurity that goes along with it. They're equal. So you do have to leave. So what do they say? Uh, even though it says Bo in that verse, they say, Rabaye, Rabba says to him, Amale, Yeme, Kol Yeme. It doesn't say the days. It says all the days. The word all is always an inclusive word. So, that teaches you even a Mitzorah Muchlat, uh, Muzgar, has to be sent out of the camp. So that's why Bo there could mean only the one who has real sickness. But in this case, there's a different word that comes to include. Now they say, well, if that's the case, if you're going to treat him like a Mitzorah, we'll treat him like a Mitzorah. Maybe he needs the purification process like a Mitzorah, the birds, the shaving. So, and yet it says they don't. So why not? If you're going to treat them the same. By the way, this question, Ihachi, some people say the word Ihachi doesn't appear. It's not actually a continuation of the flow here. It's kind of going back and saying, well, why is there a difference between Tiglachad and Sipoim? It's not necessarily connected to what we just saw. So they say, it says, And he sees it was healed. Then he starts this whole purification process. So notice what it says. He was healed. Now, if you get out of quarantine and you don't have corona, nobody says you were healed. They just say you got out of quarantine. So, the one who was connected to healing, therefore it excludes the one who it had to do with days and not, um, and not, um, not a disease. Okay, so therefore only the one with the disease needs to glach up the tisporet. Okay, we're going to stop here. We'll start with this next mission tomorrow. I'd like to finish the page, but I'd also not like to go too much over time. So we'll stop here. And uh, that was a complicated daf in and of itself. The next part is pretty simple. So we'll get to that in the beginning of tomorrow's daf. Have a great day, everyone.